Ever been tempted to get behind the wheel of a car after a few drinks? Coming up, a few reasons why drinking and driving don't mix. We'll look at some of the names and faces that helped shape the headlines this year. Got an old tattoo you don't want? Erase it. The news is next. You're watching 17 First Coast News at 11. Now, all the news in 30 minutes. James. Jaguars players and fans take off for the cold north for a game tomorrow that's heating up the River City tonight. State troopers blame a deadly bridge-closing pileup in St. Petersburg on Mother Nature. And some striking women hope to strike a chord when it comes to research into paralysis. Good evening, our top story. This could be a great weekend for you. Be careful not to mess it up by drinking and driving. Police are setting up DUI checkpoints on the First Coast tonight. Our Nancy Wright joins us from the beaches now where state troopers and sheriff's deputies have set one up. Nancy? Terry, we're at Atlantic Boulevard and Mayport Road. We want to show you right now they're making a, an arrest right at this moment. About 50 officers are here. Seven arrests have been made so far. Now, 11 is the record, and they've only been here a little more than an hour. They plan on being here until 2 a.m. Now, if you're 21 years old or under, you need to listen up because a new law will go into effect January 1st that could affect you. Trish McNulty is a 21-year-old waitress at Fat Tuesdays. She says she's afraid of DUI checkpoints. I only run into it one time, and I wasn't drinking and driving. I was on my way home from work and all that, but they just make me nervous. I thought that I'm getting pulled over without, you know, any reason. Starting January 1st, a new law will affect people Trisha's age. If you're 21 or under and have a blood alcohol level of .02 or more, your license will be suspended for six months. The legal blood alcohol limit is .08. That means having three or four drinks in an hour. The .02 legal limit for 21-year-olds means having one drink in an hour. Tonight, state troopers and Jacksonville Beach police are setting up DUI checkpoints. Officers are on the lookout for drivers weaving in and out of lanes, not having their headlights on, and driving at erratic speeds. So far this year, Duval County has seen 123 alcohol-related deaths. Statistics like that aren't lost on Alfonso Russ, who is the designated driver of this group. I just make sure everybody gets home safe. That's the main reason. Uh, so I get a chance to see them tomorrow, because we never know who something might happen. Trish says she thinks about getting behind the wheel after having a drink. I can't say I've never done it, but I, I don't feel comfortable riding with people that have been drinking and driving. Lieutenant Bill Leeper has some advice for you if you plan to go out drinking. Use a designated driver, call a cab, spend the night. Just don't make a decision to get behind the wheel of an automobile. Now, the officers are also issuing tickets for not wearing a safety belt, for faulty equipment, and for no proof of insurance. Back to you, Terry. Nancy Wright, live out on the beaches. Thanks for the report. In other news tonight, a jury is recommending convicted killer Chad Hines spend life in prison for killing his brother's wife. Hines was found guilty last week, you'll recall, of the murder and attempted sexual battery of his sister-in-law, Tina. Today's sentence recommendation includes no chance of parole for 25 years. Judge William Wilkes will make the final decision on Hines' sentence next month. A gunman who police describe as a close friend of his victims is still on the loose tonight. 51-year-old Ronald Williams was shot twice as he unloaded his work truck at his home on Powhatan Street yesterday. He is in serious but stable condition right now. Police are looking for Wayne Walker, the man Williams identified as his assailant. State troopers are still trying to sort out a deadly accident on a narrow stretch of road in Clay County. A pickup truck driven by 30-year-old Robert Lassiter struck a group of six bicyclists, all from Gainesville. Two of them died in the accident. 31-year-old Margaret Raynall and 46-year-old Douglas Hill. Four other people were hurt. At least two are still hospitalized. The accident happened on State Road 21, about a mile south of State Road 16. Lassiter said he saw the group, and the next thing he knew, he had hit them. There's something deeply personal about Jacksonville's do-or-die playoff game tomorrow. The Jaguars are in Buffalo right now, gearing up for the game. Players and fans left for New York this morning. Before the Jaguars left town, cheering fans lined up outside the stadium to send them off and wish them well. They say motivation is the key. They want the Jaguars to whip the Bills and come home with a playoff win, a win that would be a first. I think that's part of the reason that they won at the end of the year, the support the fans gave them. Uh, it's bad that the fans don't get behind them and stay behind them, even though they're having a little bit of bad luck. But this team is going to progress and be a great team. It's fantastic. People coming out just to watch us get on the bus. This is, this is unbelievable. So uh, we're going to bring home victory, and then we'll have a bigger party when we get back in the airport. 
Fans say win or lose, they'll be waiting at the airport when the Jaguars return this weekend. The Jaguars won't be alone when they hit Buffalo's rich stadium. Fans boarded buses and planes heading north for the game. They made sure they had plenty of warm teal and black clothes along. And you go and buy some gloves and you buy the hats and the face mask and that so you'll be able to. Hopefully we won't be able to use it, but we'll, we'll see. We're prepared. Weather permitting, the trip to Buffalo will last about 20 hours. Well, as 1996 draws to a close, we take time right now to look back at some local stories that touched our lives and shaped our community. Our Marie Foley takes a look at the year in review. A dramatic outcome in a Jacksonville courtroom makes the nation take notice. Ex-smoker Grady Carter wins three quarters of a million dollars in a landmark case against a tobacco company claiming smoking caused Please his lung seated. cancer. The case is under appeal. It was a tough year in the courts for Jacksonville police. Winston Dixon, who killed Officer Joseph Bertner, is convicted of a lesser charge of second-degree murder. Matthew Moody, convicted of shooting and permanently wounding Officer Damon Jameson, is set free pending a new trial based on a technicality. And Michael Scarborough is acquitted of attacking Officer David Mon after a traffic stop. Mon shot Scarborough five times. A major upheaval in the Jacksonville School District. The school board buys out Superintendent Larry Zanke's contract, citing dissatisfaction with his performance. And there's the still unsettled desegregation issue. The school board is asking the courts to finally declare them desegregated. No ruling yet. The NAACP, the plaintiff in the lawsuit, is challenging the request. It was a year for sad farewells. Jacksonville's former first lady, Patricia Austin, is killed in a car crash while traveling with her husband, former mayor Ed Austin. The chief of naval operations, Admiral Jeremy Borda, commits suicide. The First Coast military community pays last respects with memorials. And an immigrant family from Russia says painful goodbyes after three family members are gunned down by one of the victim's boyfriend. A mother, her brother, and her father are killed. Dozens fall ill in the Fleming Island area after a Giardia and Cryptosporidium outbreak, forcing residents to drink bottled water. No cause nor any new cases have been identified. Too much water caused some major flooding problems in October all over the First Coast. The waterlogging came from several days of rain combined with a nor'easter. Hurricane Bertha forces a hurricane warning for the First Coast, the first in several years. Residents stock up, but she takes a last-minute turn away from us. Jacksonville Mayor John Delaney launches his intensive care effort to clean up neglected neighborhoods and schools and boost community pride. The metro area celebrates its millionth resident. The Olympic torch passes through the First Coast, as does John F. Kennedy Jr. as he weds Carolyn Bissett on Cumberland Island in a secret ceremony. A major transportation link, the Buckman Bridge, expands from four to eight lanes. And after years of planning, work on a new Fuller-Warren Bridge begins. Despite big plans, the Jam Splash Black College Reunion Weekend proves a weak spring break draw. But Jacksonville was a big draw for political heavy hitters this election year. Hillary Clinton, Vice President Al Gore, and Bob and Elizabeth Dole and Jack Kemp all came to town. Jacksonville University announces plans to launch a football program. And after just two years in the NFL, the Jacksonville Jaguars make the playoffs. It's been quite a year, hasn't it? Now let's check out first weather. Here's Jeff. All right, Terry, and this is the scene from the satellite's uh, point of view tonight. A lot of clouds across the area, along with a stuck weather front. The two are teaming up to concentrate moisture in the backyard. That means fog once again, dense fog. We'll look at your weekend forecast coming up later in weather. Hundreds of hostages are still with their captors in Peru. Just ahead, Lima is placed under a state of emergency as negotiators receive orders not to back down. And meet a Miami man who says leggy models don't have to stand to be beautiful. A big bowl game for a Jacksonville native, and we'll hear from Bobby Bowden and Steve Spurrier as they arrive in New Orleans. And stick with us, because this is our final weeknight newscast. And later, a farewell. You're watching First Coast News at 11 with Terry Casey. Weather with Jeff Donald and sports with Mike Lyons. All the news in 30 minutes.
Lady Di. See the good-hearted princess make a house call to comfort a family in need. It's Diana's Good Deed on Art Coffee. 11.35 p.m. on 17 JKS. Peru will stand tough against a band of guerrillas in that country's lengthening hostage crisis. None of the 103 hostages was freed today. The Red Cross made another delivery to the Japanese ambassador's home where they're being held. Peru's Congress voted to support President Alberto Fujimori's decision not to negotiate with the rebels. The standoff began 10 days ago. Fujimori has placed the capital under a state of emergency. The order suspends some constitutional guarantees and, among other things, allows arrests without warrants. A hostage situation in the U.S. has just come to an end after a gunman held police at bay for several hours in Illinois. It happened at a mall in Skokie. The man fired several shots as he took over the salon today. No one was hurt, thank goodness. Police say the gunman is the ex-boyfriend of a salon worker. Florida prisoners will still be able to get out of prison early if they behave. At least that is what the U.S. Supreme Court decided. Today, the high court ruled it would not interfere with the Florida ruling that restores time off for good behavior for state prisoners. State Attorney General Bob Butterworth had tried to rescind time off for as many as 64,000 inmates. His efforts stemmed from the scheduled early release of a convicted child killer. Now, if you have a tattoo that has outgrown its novelty for you and you don't know how to get rid of it, a Clearwater Clinic may have the answer for you. Doctors at the Central Medical Clinic have a laser that can erase nearly all signs of it without any scarring. The treatment ranges from $95 to $200, and it takes about five hours to get rid of what they say is an average tattoo. The new year, it is on the horizon. Time for a new calendar. A Miami calendar maker wants to raise awareness and sensitivity toward those who suffer from paralysis. Robert Vito explains. They are attractive. These women featured in a 1997 calendar. Pin-up Deborah Davis was a dance instructor. I work full time and, and I have the girls and they're the greatest joy, you know, in my life, you know. So, you know, God gave me that. But it is not just the beauty of these young women that makes them special. It is their courage and determination not to give in to the spinal cord injuries that left them wheelchair bound. They say this calendar called Women on Wheels shows what they're all about. It shows that, that we, we have lives, that we have desires, and we're not just people sitting in wheelchairs. Putting this calendar together also has another purpose, raising money for the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis at the University of Miami Jackson Memorial Medical Center. This year, Green participated in one of the center's studies. You said we're going to walk a few and then take the load off. Yeah, like we'll, we'll just do one lap here. Every little bit of research that they do adds to, to any bit that they can find for us to to help our lives be make, make better lives for ourselves. Danny Ruiz dreamed up the calendar idea. His first edition in 1996 offered men on wheels. Ruiz was Mr. January. It's a lot of things that, uh, that I'm grateful and to be thankful for, and that's kind of what motivated me to uh, do this for the, for the project. One small step for mankind, one giant step for Danny. Ruiz says research done here led to a device called a functional electrical stimulator that enables him to take steps and stand tall. It's not going to replace the wheelchair by any means, but it's an, I mean, a tremendous alternative to have to get out, to exercise, to stand up, to, you know, to look at other people in the eye. All proceeds from the $10 calendar go to rehabilitation research at the Miami Project. Bye. Robert Vito, CNN, Miami. Late night and early morning maneuvering may be tough on the first coast. Jeff's going to have the foggy forecast coming up next. Plus, we'll tell you how the fog had very different consequences for several Florida drivers. You never know what will happen when it's live. Are we on the air? Live with Regis and Kathy Lee. Hey! 9 a.m. on 17 JKS.
The Florida Highway Patrol says heavy fog and speeding drivers may have caused a major pileup in St. Petersburg. A series of chain collision reactions closed the 10-mile-long Sunshine Skyway for several hours this morning. One person was killed. Dozens were hurt, including an 11-month-old baby who was in critical condition. Troopers say as many as 50 vehicles were involved. Fog in central Florida may have helped police nab a pair of suspected bandits. They led police on a dramatic chase through two counties this morning. Police say the chase began after the two robbed a truck driver as the man tried to deliver produce. The chase ended in downtown Orlando in a minor fender bender, and the suspects are right now behind bars. Well, our last two stories were all about fog. The first coast hasn't been neglected by that animal either. Second night in a row, dense yeah. fog, and I think more on the way for a couple more nights, too. Right now at the International Airport, visibility down to less than one quarter of a mile. Dense fog not only there, it's everywhere from Brunswick all the way down to St. Augustine and inland as well over to the west side. 56 degrees right now, humidity can go no higher, the wind is calm, stage is set. Widespread dense fog will continue overnight, maybe a bit of drizzle here and there as well. Temperatures will remain in the 50s. Now I'll take you out to space, and you can see we've got uh, a little bit of a weather maker. It's, it's kind of a weak weather front loitering across the southeast, helping to enhance the moisture, helping to give us uh, the fog. Meanwhile, a lot of moisture has been coming into the western states. Heavy snow, heavy rain out there. Here's tomorrow's uh, weather map then, and we're going to see that high pressure pretty much dominates around here, although it's weak high pressure. going to be kind of a wishy-washy day like, like today was. But here comes the next Arctic blast. Will it get here? Stay tuned. Tomorrow, it'll begin with fog. Then it'll turn partly sunny in the afternoon. Temperatures will range from the low 70s well inland to low 60s at the beaches. Now on the waters, there will be a light sea breeze. The sea is only a foot or two. With uh, It'll be flat on the inland waters. And here are tomorrow's tides at Mayport. Surf temperature now 58 degrees. Now on Sunday, that next Arctic cold front, wow, it moves well down into a America's heartland. Does it get here in time for the New Year's? Here's the five-day forecast. The answer is not going to happen. We're going to see 70s over the weekend and 70s through New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, too. I see no Arctic outbreaks coming our way. I see no major rain or anything else events either for the area just more delightful weather heading out tomorrow morning not quite so delightful morning fog and dense in some cases wake up temperatures will be in the 50s i'm impressed have been for a long time you do a good job thanks jeff <laughs> thanks. well florida and florida state made their way to new orleans today and mike is going to have a sugar bowl preview next also the bowl seasons continued in south florida mike is up next to show you how the hurricanes fared he's all over the place On the next Entertainment Tonight, exclusive, Merv Griffin talks for the first time about his brave battle with cancer that nearly took his life. What was your reaction when you first, when the doctor first told you about this? A disbelief. The tabloids had him at death's door. Now the TV mogul comes to us to set the record straight. So here I am. Then, Halle Berry in Bosnia. She's cheering up the troops in her own Courage Under Fire on Entertainment Tonight. Monday night at 7 on 17 JKS. How Hollywood's hottest stars are heating things up for the holidays. Plus a sizzling swimwear photo shoot this weekend on Entertainment Tonight. 11.30 p.m. on 17 JKS. The Tar Heels and the Mountaineers having a real adventure long before their Gator Bowl matchup. Tonight, the teams had time off for a little R&R &R at Adventure Landing, and fans got to meet them. Putt-putt golf, video games, just some of the events they got to, well, try anyway. The Tar Heels said they really banged it up out on the go-kart track. I might have wrecked about six or seven times, but it's all in fun. Everybody was acting kind of tired when we first got on the bus when they mentioned the word go-karts. Everybody got kind of happy. <laughs> <laughs> Kickoff for the Gator Bowl, by the way, January 1st, 1230, where? Right here on 17 JKS. Since we're talking about football, we got to be thinking tomorrow as well in Buffalo. Right, and I really feel anything can happen, and Jaguars certainly have a chance to win it after the last six weeks with them. Anything, anything can happen. 
T-minus 13 hours and counting. At 12.30 tomorrow, the Jaguars will take the field in Buffalo, facing a Bills squad that has not lost a playoff game at home in nine tries. About 10 o'clock this morning, the Jaguars left one stadium place in front of hundreds of screaming and excited fans. They were appreciative of the fan support, of course. Some of the players said they had butterflies. Others said they didn't. Still others said maybe closer to game time. All said they were excited to have this opportunity. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm definitely ready to go. I don't have any butterflies. I'm not nervous, you know. I've, I've been there before, so it's just a matter of going out and playing well and hopefully doing it again. I'm getting excited. This, uh, this is a big boost right here, seeing all the fan support here, you know. Uh, we just want to go out there and do our best. we got nothing to lose. We're just going to play with a team on a mission. In just six days, a sequel will take place between the Knowles and Gators. It's a game the Gators hope to get revenge in since they lost the first game uh, almost a month ago. Earlier in the day, Bobby Bowden and company left Tallahassee for New Orleans, where they will not only practice, but take part in all the activities leaving, leave, leading up to the game. When Coach Bowden walked off the plane, the New Orleans media asked the question about playing those Gators one more time. Well, I'm over, I'm over it, but it's, it takes all the fun out of it. I mean, gee whiz. You go to a bowl, you want to try to, I mean, it's kind of a reward for your players, but not when you play your state rival. Uh, you know, how you like Tulane and LSU in the Sugar Bowl? <laughs> you know, they're just not a happy, they're not a happy group of campers. Do you feel like you passed the final exam already and you've got to take it again now, maybe? Very much, very much. You, you know, Florida, uh, they might be the best team in the country. They were number one the last time we played them and we beat them. Now you got to beat them again. As for the Gators, they also took off earlier today for New Orleans. They will begin practicing for the game tomorrow. They will also participate in all those pregame activities. And uh, also, Steve Spurrier says, hey, that casino, Riverboat Casino docked on the Mississippi, that is off limits. But he certainly knows, the head Gator, that uh, possible national title rides on this game. It is a little bit more important game, but again, uh, I guess we're a little bit like Arizona State. We're just here to play the best game we can. We'll let the national championship, uh, you know, we can't worry about other games or how people vote. All we can concern ourselves with trying to play our best against uh, FSU. If you plan on checking out the Florida-Florida State matchup January 2nd, make sure you tune in to the 17 JKS at 7.30, 30 minutes before kickoff of the Sugar Bowl. Our crack First Coast sports team will break it down in our sports special, Sunshine Showdown, the sequel to the Liberty Bowl where Syracuse played Houston. Syracuse running back Malcolm Thomas of Jacksonville ran for 201 yards and a touchdown. He was the MVP. Orange men win it 30 to 17 over the Cougars. Thomas averaged eight yards a carry. Seventh straight bowl win for Syracuse. Also tonight to the Carquest Bowl where the Miami Hurricanes were in Joe Robbie Stadium versus Virginia. Miami quarterback Ryan Clement goes 69 yards to Util Green for the score. Tremaine Mack, he would return a fumble on the kickoff for a touchdown. He also had an interception for a touchdown. Miami wins it the final 31 to 21. The University of Georgia will appear before the NCAA enforcement staff next month after admitting its football program violated four rules. The school has denied six other allegations in releasing its response to the NCAA infractions committee. Georgia officials will wait until its January meeting before deciding whether to sanction itself. Among the violations the school admitted to today were those involving Florida youth sports organizer Dan Calloway. Calloway has been accused of acting as an athletic department representative and offering incentives to athletes to sign at Georgia. Of course, the Jaguars game at 12.30 tomorrow is here on 17, as well as the second game. A lot of people will be tuned into that. As I am known to do occasionally, let me put you on, uh, get you off the fence and get a uh, prediction from you. 24-20 Jaguars. All right, I've got 27-14 Jaguars. You want to, all right? Okay, one more thing. Yeah. This is your finale, our finale tonight. Before we go, a special goodbye for you from a class act and a good friend. We'll go live to Boston. What? Live to Boston. All right. Can you hear me out there? Happy holidays, Jacksonville. This is Tori Ryden live in Boston. I want to say hello and, unfortunately, goodbye to my friends, my partner, Terry Casey, out there. How you doing, mister? Tori, uh, needless to say, this is a wonderful shock. Oh, good. Oh, good. I love to shock you, Terry. I, you know, I just got to say, this is such a sad night, but you know what? You got to look at it on the positive side. You have a great future ahead of you. Um, I think you've got a job probably right across the street at Rock 105. You can kick the other Terry out of the chair, be Lex and Terry yourself. I think that he'd graciously give that job up for you. 
I thank you for that plug. Uh, he may be have had a hangman's noose out the door when I leave tonight. Listen, oh. I got to I got to tell you something, Tor. Uh, you use the word sad. Yeah, bittersweet. Sad in, in one one sense, but at the same time, there are a lot of uh, a lot of beginnings underway, and I think that's going to keep it from being real sad. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, you know, and also you got to remember, you're a very good person, and everybody there at the station is such great people. And I got to say, good things happen to great people. I know it's been over said, but you know, I, I have such great memories, and I will always be proud to say that I worked at WJKS because I made some of the, I'm going to start crying here, uh, some of the greatest friends at that station. Um, i, I got to tell you, I miss Jacksonville a lot. I miss it primarily because of the people, my mother, my father, Ann and Dot live there, and I'm breaking up again. I'm so immature. But <laughs> i gotta, I got to just say this. You know, Bubba, I know you're sitting there, and Jeff can hear me too, and everybody in the control room, I love you guys. And just know that good things are going to come your way. Just stay positive. And, again, good things happen to good people. And I just, I know and I hope that Jacksonville will join me in wishing the folks who day in and day out work their hearts out to put on a great new show for all of Jacksonville. I know they're going to join me in wishing you guys all the best. Godspeed. God look out for you. You're going to do a great job. You know, August 9th, your final night, you cried then, and I had to say this. We'll be right back. Tori, love you. Love you. Well, that call from Tori is sort of hard to top, but let me do this. Tonight's final word is always tough to say when you leave family and friends, and tonight really is no different. Farewell. This is the final weeknight newscast here on 17 JKS, and there's a story behind this. 17 JKS president and general manager Jim Matthews will join me on Face Off Sunday evening to tell the story of a network switch from ABC to Warner Brothers and explain why, come Monday, we won't be joining you anymore. The company itself uh, did some research.